All right. This is uh, our lecture on ideology and values, trying to understand global warming denialism. Um, if all things are working right, you should have heard uh, one through five uh, in class, and this is your lecture video uh, for the hybrid portion of the course where I'm covering six and seven. So let me zoom, quick review for all that stuff. Okay, so uh, six evolutionary coalitional theory. Um, I'm gonna first talk about what it means for uh, for an approach to be socio-functional, and then we're gonna talk about evolutionary coalitional theory and talk about the three ideological orientations that it posits. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about a complementary theory, parent-offspring theory. Okay, so I have this tool here, which um, many of you may not recognize. And if you looked at that tool, you would want to try to figure out, uh, or you might want to try to figure out what it does. Well, that's the approach um, we're trying to take with the evolutionary coalitional theory, is we're looking at different ideological um, orientations and trying to see what kind of purposes they might achieve socially. So in other words, socio-functional means taking a, um, looking at the social function of some kind of behavior. So we're assuming there's an adaptation at work here, that this is something that in the ancestral environment, at least sometimes uh, produced a payoff and produce some kind of social good for the person that was pursuing it. So basically it's the idea that any orientation is a certain tool to achieve some kind of purpose. So what we're gonna do is look at different selection pressures in the ancestral social life, um, recognize how there's some cross pressuring, um, that is there's some conflictive pressuring, get my pen going here. Uh, so there's different selective pressures and then they're cross pressured, which means that they're not always pushing in the same direction. And then that leads us to the position of strategic pluralism, which is similar to what we see with mating strategies. So there's a lot of evidence that people have different mating strategies, men versus women, and that um, both of them might have long-term and short-term mating strategies. So there's not a one size fits all or one size fits every situation. Um, to maximize reproductive fitness. So the key here is trying to see different ideologies as seeking different kinds of goals. So in the answer to the crucial question of what this tool is, um, this you would use to grab a um, circular oil filter and um, apply pressure to it so you can turn it and take it out of the vehicle, just in case you wanted to know. Okay, uh, I'm done with my pen. All right, so We've got three different types of orientations we're gonna talk through here in the evolutionary coalitional model. Um, the first one is um, gonna end up being the RWA binding kind of orientation. But we wanna imagine that in the coalitional environment, you have a, different groups fighting over resources. So there's a lot of evidence in the anthropological record um, that our human ancestors um, would go to war. Um, it was small scale, but um, definitely um, was violence between groups. And so the more formidable groups could take more resources. So this presents the selective pressure of a need for security. So in the ancestral environment, we're gonna argue that you didn't have governments, you didn't have a United Nations. So what you needed was a group that had internal cohesion and had strict norms in order for that group to prevail. So you've got these um, complex dynamics that'll produce these conflicting pressures that lead to different strategies. And the first strategy we're focusing on here is this need for security. Okay, so where does the RWA slash binding come from? Uh, we think about groups in competition between uh, each other. We can imagine that those groups that had greater order, um, greater compliance, they maintained a stricter boundary about where their group begins and ends, uh, would perhaps prevail, and that would provide some security for them. So we can see the different traits that would line up with RWA, or what we might call social conservatism, as promoting fitness in that way. Okay, next, the tricky thing, though, is 
uh, once you have coalitions, you have the power to exploit things. So anytime you're well organized and you have some powerful individuals, um, that can be a good defense, but it can also be a good offense. So coalitions, in essence, create these power differences, both within groups and between groups. So you have some leader or leaders and um, some people that are trying to work together. Uh, but once you have that kind of selective, excuse me, once you have that kind of institution or those kind of power differences, there's the opportunity for exploitation. So some individuals who will be using to, willing to use that power to cheat or steal to gain more resources, um, that would be the exploitive SDO orientation that we see in politics. So the short story here is, once you have power, it'd be surprising if some people didn't want to use it in kind of dark ways to get more resources. All right, and then um, our next and final strategy is you can imagine that once you've um, had this exploitation strategy as a potential, that certain individuals could seek gain by avoiding that exploitation. So people that refuse to accept hierarchies, refuse to recognize power differences, might be less able to get exploited by elites. And um, that would give us this universal liberating kind of orientation. Another key component of that is that you're going to look to create allies outside of your group. So you're kind of trans-coalitional, or you're forming coalitions outside of your native kin group, so to speak. Okay, and I'll point out that this can accommodate some other theories. So if you recall, Jost um, was defining conservatism as anti-change and pro-hierarchy. We can see the anti-change showing up in the RWA orientation to maintain group cohesion. So in other words, to keep everybody on the same page and coordinated against other groups. And pro-hierarchy. So the idea that you that powerful groups can dominate others, or the idea that uh, you're going to need some differences in rank, that might potentially help organize groups. And then when you look at um, Height's moral foundations theory, um, the three hallmarks there he has of the binding orientation, the in-group loyalty, authority, respect, purity, and sanctity, the first two would make you a better coalitional member. So if you're somebody that showed in-group loyalty, or you showed respect for authority, other people would say, hey, he's the kind of guy I would want in my coalition. And then um, when you imagine purity and sanctity norms, so ideas about who you can uh, mate with, ideas about what you can eat, those can set up boundaries between different groups. So we see this, um, conservatives are more easily disgusted. You can see this, um, like people that are eating different kinds of foods and what they're used to. Um, oftentimes people are, have a ew kind of reaction to that. And that would keep you from fraternizing with other coalitions. Okay, so to summarize this in terms of our Schwartz model, you can imagine here in um, pink, we have the RWA. So you're going to get more security. And because you have these strict norms and conformity and tradition, you're going to get more kin support. So kinship or um, families and all the connections around families would be the traditional way of organizing in the ancestral environment. And you're going to have um, the, the cost here, the little zeros mean costs, um, less self-direction, and you're at risk for exploitation. Um, so once, speaking of exploitation, we have the SDO orientation. It's another socio-functional strategy. It, it's good at acquiring resources, and you can gain status and power, which lets you get additional resources. The problem is you can be seen as a bad collaborator or selfish, so you're at risk of condemnation and exclusion for that. And you're also, um, you're also at risk for exploitation. Okay, and then the, the third group um, are yellow-bellied, weak-kneed liberals. Um, you're going to have less exploitation risk and more self-direction, um, but the problem is you're not going to be as... Off, as able to offer a collective defense based on kinship support. So one thing we might think about is some of these are going to work better in some environments versus others. If you're in an environment that is very hostile and a lot of conflict between groups, you might gravitate, toward, gravitate towards this end of the circle. Um, 
And then when you are um, less at risk and there's less conflict between groups and whatnot, you're going to gravitate towards this end of the circle. So it's possible to see this as an axis um, where you would have on one end more high threat environments, on the other end um, lower threat environments. Okay, and then there's one addition to the um, evolutionary coalitional theory that I'm working on. Um, and that is the parent offspring theory. There's some genetic logic that I'm not going to go into that has to do with what genes or what proportion of genes you share with other relatives. And just the way it works out, parents will have a greater desire for their children to cooperate unselfishly, but children have more incentive to invest in their own children vis-a-vis -vis other relatives um, or vis-a-vis -vis their, their uh, brothers and sisters. So here we have a classic example of this in the, the wild. Each chick is, wants to get as much of the mother's resources as possible. Um, the mother wants all the chicks to survive and prosper, but it's in, if one of the chicks can outcompete the brothers or sisters, it's going to have a slight advantage. And certainly when these guys have their own chicks, um, they're going to want to favor them over trying to just cooperate with um, cousins or their, um, their siblings' kids. So um, that's Trivers. That's basic parent-offspring conflict. And then Crespi and Summers and Crespi by himself have developed this model where they're trying to understand religion as a method that parents use to control offspring. Now, it's not conscious, of course, but the idea is that religion gets you to revere your ancestors, um, and um, oftentimes you have a god or a father kind of authority figure, or like in Chinese religions, lots of times you're worshiping the ancestors themselves. Um, you have, um, I should say, Asian religions, um, and you have this uh, promotion of altruistic sacrifice for kin. So you can see that in the, um, in the New Testament, for example, this idea of um, being one in the body of Christ, and there's this idea that um, we're called through divine sanction or divine recommendation to be um, sacrificial for each other. So it's this method of trying to bind different people together in this way that will have your, your group your kin, I'll compete, other kin groups. Um, and one thing I like about this theory is it could finally explain the social conservative obsession with sexuality. So if there's pressure to marry within the kin group, that would make sense because that would promote inclusive fitness within um, those individuals. In other words, if my genes are to some extent tied up in my brothers or my sisters, if I help them, and they help me, and there's a wider system that's making all of us do that together, then we collectively can benefit from that. Um, the other thing we see with um, social conservatives is this restriction on um, sexuality. So there's this idea that you don't want kin, kids to, you don't want your offspring to have sex out of wedlock because then you could get kids that aren't attached to your kin group and weaker ties, but you want kids to marry early and you want your children to have their children when they are young. Um, that way, if there's that bias, they're more likely, the older generation is more likely to have some control and influence over the younger generation. So what would that look like if we layer that on top of our evolutionary model? Um, so the, the red strategy then um, is the restricting the offspring of sex and forcing kin cooperation. And religion gets tied in here as well, and that's a big part of the social conservatism. And then um, SDO is kind of off to the side. They're doing their own thing where they're more inclined to engage in um, low commitment mating, and there's some evidence for this with SDO. But uh, we could call this, what's in the literature is called a fast life strategy. In other words, kind of fast and loose, more uh, promiscuous. Um, but the, the main trade-off here is between the social conservatives and the liberals. And you can see here, one way of understanding uh, this before I said is a trade-off in terms of security, um, which makes sense, but you can also think about it as perhaps folks over here on the more liberal end are trying to seek out the best possible mates and they don't want to be limited by the kin network. 
So you can imagine somebody that's interested in people of different religions or different ethnic groups would have an advantage when seeking mates if it was a secure environment because you could potentially get a, a better spouse. And you might develop broader social networks that would have some control. And you see there's this resistance to the control of sexuality. So the reason, one of the reasons I like this is one of the hallmark debates between social conservatives and liberals is abortion. And this would um, clearly line up on that. Okay, next, um, moving on to some explicit environmental implications of um, ideology and values. How, in other words, how those dynamics affect what we can do for the environment. All right, we are ready for the last section here, looking at the environmental implications of some of these theories about ideology. So we'll look at SDO, specifically how it can motivate some denial and manipulation. Uh, we'll look at the RWA binding as an area that can be recruited to that denialism uh, agenda. And then we'll also look, pull on some sociology to understand the broader um, sociological um, environment, sociological uh, phenomenon that's at work behind denying climate change. Then a few empirical studies uh, that have some interesting findings. And then I want to put this in a broader concept of the um, what some authors have called the plutocratic populism uh, of our current political moment. Okay, so if we imagine SDO speaking, what would it sound like? So, in other words, if we imagine that there are some exploitive motives at work in denying global warming, um, how might that, what that might that sound like? So imagine if you could give some truth serum to somebody that was in the fossil fuel industry. He might say, the scientific case for global warming is overwhelming and it grows daily. Only a moron would deny it. If you have a pro-growth case to make, then man up and make it. Don't hide behind ignorance. I don't oppose sound climate policy because it's flawed. I oppose it because I care much more about my short-term economic interests than the future of the damn planet. Hello? Okay, so in other words, I'm just trying to give you a caricature, uh, to be honest, of that position, but we think we could, if you could locate it in the Schwartz value circle, it would be down here uh, with the status and the power uh, being as the primary drivers. And um, this is that SDO, social dominance orientation, uh, which aligns with economic conservatism, financial power, etc. And we're going to see um, how that's opposed by environmentalists and liberals that are over here motivated by things like universalism and self-direction, uh, where you have broader concerns and you're not so sensitive to threat. Um, but what we'll see going on, there's this interesting dynamic where the economic conservatives or the SDO types are going to have an influence on the social conservatives. And there's just going to be this recruitment process whereby they try to pull these folks into the global warming denial camp. So, um, and again, from a ideological perspectives, we can think of these folks as more culturally conservatives, traditionalists. Not all of them would be white supremacists, but some of that flavor would be in there. Um, and we have those three distinct areas. Okay, so um, interestingly enough, if you want to look at different religious groups, the ones that uh, where you find the highest um, denial is with the white evangelicals. So there's a number of different evangelical churches, but like if you think the Southern Baptists, that would definitely um, be the white evangelical block. And it's just fascinating that that 28 is a lot lower than anything else. So really, as you find the unaffiliates, uh, they are pretty much convinced that there is human-caused global warming. Uh, and if you look at the white mainland, excuse me, the white evangelicals, a lot lower. So what's what's going on there? Um, well, it a few things. It over it overlaps oftentimes with a southern, often rural kind of identity, um, where you're going to get a more racially conservative kind of identity. So there's definitely a way in which um, these folks are resenting the so-called liberal elites. 
Um, it makes them kind of ripe to, uh, soldiers to be recruited by the economic conservatives for this uh, battle of good versus evil. Uh, the salvation typically in, in this kind of uh, religious tradition is defined in very, very narrow terms. Um, I've seen some argue that it comes out of uh, commitment to social hierarchy like slavery, where you don't want to engage broader issues that might um, lead to uncomfortable truths. So you focus more on the narrow and the personal. Um, and it's just related to the head scratcher where white evangelicals are also um, a big supporter of Trump. So let me just slip back for a second here. Um, so certainly these folks are into the conformity and tradition, but the security and power are not uh, foreign to their concerns either. So I think that explains some of the support for Trump in that he's somebody that's delivering on some of the things that they want. Um, okay, but the bottom line here is that just religion is part of this larger system and culture. So it's not just um, somebody's personal beliefs, which is what we sometimes think about it as. You can also think about different religious traditions as uh, framing a certain approach to the world, and they're more or less amenable to certain ideologies. And uh, the religious perspective often lines up with this uh, conformity, tradition, security, and power kind of stuff, which um, can be convenient for the more SDO types. Okay, so what does the organized climate change denial uh, look like as a sociological phenomenon? Uh, Dunlap has written a lot about this. Uh, in this article with uh, McWright, um, but they have this uh, climate change denial machine. And uh, their basic argument is you have some plutocrats or folks that are heavily invested in the current um, greenhouse gas intensive environment like the Koch brothers, um, funding a lot of mechanisms to affect public opinion and the courts and whatnot. So if you see the way it works is you have the fossil fuel industry, corporate America in general, conservative foundations founding this infrastructure of conservative think tanks and front groups. So a front group is and takes on certain positions, um, but it's a little bit of a way of obscuring who is really giving you the money. And then um, down here on the bottom half, all these things are feeling into this echo chamber where you have the media, blogs, or Twitter, and politicians um, kicking this around and ex and emphasizing and um, echoing that point. And so, and then also you get these AstroTurf organizations, AstroTurf meaning that it looks like grassroots, but it's not really true grass. It's not really true um, bottom up, um, but they're organizations that um, can advance the agenda of their uh, the larger uh, money elites. Okay, so basically, it's a way of funneling, converting economic power into political power. So how does that work? Um, so money certainly buys influence. Uh, that's one thing I want you to think about. But also this, notice how Inhofe here is using this religious language to um, kind of draw on the RWA, religious conservative stuff, to advance his case. The reason I'm not impressed with science and scientists is because the Lord Almighty can overcome all those so-called facts in the blink of an eye. So he's suggesting there's some kind of tension between environmentalists who are secular, maybe, and religious belief. Um, he once brought a snowball to the Senate floor to convince people global warming wasn't happening. Um, he's received a lot of money from the fossil fuel industry. And if you look at the state he represents, uh, Oklahoma is very rich in gas and oil resources. So Oklahoma's down here. So it, there's just a certain logic in terms of the way power and money uh, will influence uh, politics. Okay, and then um, Fox News and other conservative media are this dominant force in terms of shaping the agenda for a large number of Americans. And Public Citizen is a, a longstanding uh, public good kind of uh, investigative journalism advocacy organization associated with Ralph Nader. Um, but they did this analysis of Fox News and climate denial, um, and they found in the uh, first half of 2019, 86% of the climate discussions were dismissive of the climate crisis. And you might know, I mean, some 97% of scientists or more um, are convinced global warming is occurring and it's man-made. So how do they do this? Um, 
they're trying to, I would suggest, trigger the radical change fear. So the, this analysis of these different um, media reports uh, on Fox identified three different messages. One, that climate change is a vehicle for uh, Democrats' radical big government agenda. Um, so trying to tie it to um, some way in which big government's going to come along and take away your freedoms. Um, it's they also make the argument it's going to kill our economy and send us back to the Stone Age so that it's this radical change that's being proposed. Um, and they also accuse um, climate crisis as liberal hysteria. So trying to recruit some tribal loyalties there, in-group, out-group stuff that we know uh, we've seen and talked about in the coalitional model of, of ideology. All right. You also see um, oftentimes this framing. We just saw it before with Inhofe's statement, but here's another one where the environment is framed as competing with your duties as a Christian. The most important thing to the Christian community is not uh, the environment, but evangelicalism. Um, so this is a quote that's uh, suggesting there's this tension this is from an advocate, obviously, and here's a bird covered in oil, and I don't think he's happy with this perspective. Just as a quick aside, there's a wide range of views that fall within Christianity, and just to disclose, I attend uh, a church that I think many people would accuse of being liberal, um, and there's, like I said, not everything is going to fall under the same brush, but we're talking about just some broad tendencies that you'll see. Okay, and then um, on to some specific studies that highlight certain things. Um, so this is Milfont and Sibley. They did this neat study uh, showing how SDO relates to um, attitudes about nature. They're expanding the scope of SDO's theory, trying to say that, you know, if these folks prefer hierarchical relationships uh, in general, they, that same thinking might get applied to nature. So we'll look at this, but they present folks with this scenario about a potential mining operation, but they craftily manipulate it as either um, benefiting rich people or benefiting the wider public. And then they looked at how uh, people responded to that in terms of whether or not they would support that proposed project. Okay, so in the hierarchy enhancing condition, they say rare minerals have been found on private land. The land is owned by a wealthy family. And they talk about it's going to make millions of dollars in profits and only wealthy investors, other wealthy investors are either to buy into this. And then the key thing, profits be exclusive to the mining company and its investors. So that's one condition. And another condition got the hierarchy attenuating condition. So attenuate means to make weaker. So in this kind of scenario, they highlight the local community has voted and uh, the profits will go directly to the community, and the profits will be shared equally by all in the local community. And what they found is that as SDO increases, there was greater support for the proposed mining operation if the benefits went to the wealthy. So what that's suggesting is there's something about uh, that economic conservatism position and exploiting the environment that uh, echoes a belief that life is this competition and we want to favor the hierarchy of some people are better than others, uh, but it's tied into this uh, broader kind of sense of uh, life is a struggle and you want to come out on top and support those that are going to come out on top. Okay, and then another new study looked at um, concern for global warming depending on, they varied uh, where or not it was going to have an impact. Um, so it was either going to, uh, it was either impacting upstate New York. I forgot the word New York there. Sorry, I should write that. New York. Um, or France. And uh, this will show a difference um, based on um, ideology interacting with uh, where the supposed harm is going to occur. And then we're going to look at support for uh, mitigation efforts to reduce the impact of global warming. Okay, so here's the great uh, study. So condition one, low social distance, they talked about people in upstate New York. So you have these pictures of people uh, that look like they might live in upstate New York. I don't know, could be. Um, but they use the same people in a very similar story about 
the impact of global warming leading to a health crisis, but they switch it to France as the place where it's occurring. Well, they get this interesting effect where if you're liberal, you're more or less concerned um, regardless of where it's occurring, if it's in upstate France or New York. But if you're a strong Republican, it breaks out where you have less concern if it's France versus New York. Um, that's this difference here, and then versus a control. So there's this, again, you get to see with uh, conservative ideology, there's this in-group, out-group kind of tendency. So the, the takeaway from that is if you want to talk about the impact of global warming, talk about its local impact. Okay, and then this is a crucial study that shows how the framing of the environment as threatening, as environmentalists as threatening, uh, produce this other way to activate global warming resistance. So the authors make the point that many times in different countries, you'll see this language where you try to demonize environmentalists. So they get called the environmental Taliban, or they're Nazis and militants, we're on an anti-energy regulatory jihad, or Hitler youth, but they're trying to activate that RWA binding orientation with this kind of language. So the basic strategy is convert um, environmental issue to an us versus them issue so you can recruit people to your side. Okay, so what's that look like? They get this nice causal model um, and they're able to determine um, the extent of uh, influence for different factors. I'm going to break it down into the left side and the right side, but these are what would be called mediating variables. So the impact of these things on environmental policy support, climate change denial, and denial that it's caused by humans, they, in some cases, at least, sorry, some of the causal influence runs through these mediating variables in the middle, and um, others, there's just a direct effect. Um, but what we're most interested in is this environmentalist threat. Um, I think you'll find this interesting. Okay, so on the left side, You've got right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation. Both of them contribute to seeing the environmentalists as a threat. So, in other words, they, this is a scale that assess things like um, seeing the, the extent to which individuals see environmentalism as a threat to tradition and culture and their way of life. So, and the other thing they have in here is utilization of nature, economic priorities. So, in other words, are you, they're trying to tease out the effect of people that just want to um, suck what they can out of nature, and that's why they're opposing things, and the one on the top here, environmentalist threat, the extent to which they see environmentalism is this foreign way of doing things that's an outgroup kind of thing, and if that has an impact. And what they interestingly show is both things make a difference, right? So you can see the environmentalist threat definitely has an impact, and these it's pretty strong. These are the, what are called beta weights, uh, uh, but you can think of them as correlations. But there's a negative relationship between environmentalist threat and environmental policy support, positive relationships to climate denial and denial that it's caused by humans. Now, what's interesting is the utilization of nature uh, so, in other words, that economic kind of argument, that has some influence, but it's, it looks to me at least like the, the burden is, is taken on by this environmentalist threat. So, in other words, uh, some of the scaremongering and um, the RWA stuff getting recruited appears to be um, a key driving factor of some of the denialism. Okay. All right, and then last, just want to say a word about the larger political climate. So in this course, one of the things we're trying to do is understand the, the broader context in which all this goes on. Um, so here we have just an example of a political cartoon making fun of the plutocrats um, from the Gilded Age uh, back in the 1920s. And the argument would be that we are in a similar kind of position now in terms of the amount of political power that the very wealthy, what we could call the plutocrats, have. So uh, the U.S. across the board on a number of issues fails to enact um, policies that most people would see as effective or that most people would agree with. Um, and part of this, uh, part of the way our politics are the way they are is because of this income wealth inequality. 
that leads to this plutocracy. So plutocracy is a way of talking about it's not a monarch, it's not a monarchy or democracy, but it's a Pluto means rich, so it's ruled by the rich or the wealthy. Okay, so the basic story is the plutocrats distract attention from the economic issues, and they outrage manufacture, um, they manufacture outrage on some other social issues, and then that disables the ability of the left to push through reform because they got everybody worried about these social issues. So first off, just a quick some snapshots of the wealth shift that has occurred. Okay, so this is going from the start in the 70s, uh, 2018. What has happened in the after-tax transfer income, um, in other words, the ultimate take-home income for the different groups? And what you can see is here at the top, um, the top 0.01% have had huge gains uh, up through 2018, whereas most people, the lower 50%, uh, 50 to 90 percent haven't really seen much gains in income. Um, so it's really a case of the upper classes, um, the very, very wealthy getting more and more wealthy. So and an a, a important distinction, this is one of those things where it's hard to represent because of the way the math works, but if you look at the average income of the entire top uh, 1% from 1950 to 2000, it looks pretty flat. It doesn't go up a lot. But when you throw in, when you break that out into the different groups, the top 0.01% um, has seen these huge gains, um, whereas everybody else hasn't. So this is almost like, you know, old Europe where you have kings and queens and dukes and earls, and then all the, the commoners are separate from them. So very different politics. Um, there's been this ownership flip. So if you look at uh, the pre-tax share of national income held by the bottom 50% versus the upper 1%. So it used to be the bottom 50% back in the 70s and 80s, the bottom 50% owned more than the top 1%. And you would think, well, yeah, that should make sense because it's 50% of people. It's not just 1%. But we're now in a situation where the top 1% earns, uh, much, earns more than the whole bottom 50% combined. So it's a pretty... Uh, dramatic switch. So what happens is, uh, once this tendency starts, these wealthy folks have more and more disposable income that they can just throw at politicians. And so it really changes the dynamics of the politics. And I would point out, it's not just Republicans that have been affected. There's many, uh, many Democrats you can point at, for example, I think the Obama, Obama administration that was not nearly as progressive on economic issues as you would say somebody like FDR was in the in the 30s. Um, so the rich have a lot of political power. Okay. Um, oh, and then, the, sorry, one more on that. The tax cuts um, are increasingly a way to just shift more and more income up to give it to the plutocrats. So it's this is what's going to happen in 2027. What they do is they build in some tax cuts for the wealthy that won't expire, but tax cuts for the lower income groups that will expire. So actually, at 2027, um, people in the lower regions of the economy will actually see their taxes go up, whereas taxes on the richest, uh, are, on the richest one percent, are cut drastically. Okay, and then just to give you another sense of this, because there's this huge wealth in disparity, um, you get um, um, you get a political party that is very much catering to that the very wealthy. So. Here is looking at political parties from several different countries, and you could locate the Democratic Party is a fairly centrist, we call this center-left kind of party. Um, but the Republican Party is actually, um, by this standard, a far-right political party, far to the right of um, what you would find in, let's see, in Britain or in Canada or in Denmark, etc. There are some ones that are really fringe that are farther out. Anyway, it's, it's become pretty extreme. And this is definitely a change that has occurred in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, so at least one way of understanding this is what, um, in a recent book, has argued um, is plutocratic populism. So that's these guys, um, Hacker and Pearson. Um, and they draw on this guy, Daniel Ziblatt, who looked at the dynamics of democracies and how they interact with their conservative parties. And this guy, Ziblatt, um, articulates what's called the conservative dilemma. 
And the basic dilemma is in a democracy, uh, you're going to have very few economic elites because they're just the very wealthy. So they have trouble winning elections if they're operating in a democracy. So the solution is they can either manufacture outrage on other issues or they can try to subvert democracy. So U.S. and another way of saying this is what's happened now, you have the leaders uh, in the Republican Party are far to the right of the American public on a number of issues like um, taxes and health care and uh, gun rights and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what's happened is the wealth, the plutocracy has really uh, demanded these far right policies. Okay, so how does that show up in terms of our politics? Um, you get this outrage on a whole number of issues. So you have the outrage about um, social issues. So, um, so anything with sexuality, or LG, resistance to LGBTQ stuff uh, or trans stuff. Um, you have this resistance about focus on immigration um, and all the harm that's causing. Um, there's in one election, there was talk about the caravan that was coming to our border and that was going to invade the U.S. Uh, and you have the conservative media playing up different kinds of uh, crises, like imagining that coronavirus was something the Chinese cooked up on purpose or uh, making a, a case that there's an immigration crisis when you look at the numbers, it's not much different than it used to be. Um, uh, religious figures um, criticizing um, anything for marriage that's not between one man and a woman. Um, and then you had the whole birther thing with Obama, where um, he was Hussein, Barack Hussein Obama, and there was uh, Trump and others um, had this uh, conspiracy theory that he really wasn't American. And then on the way darker end, you have um, guys, usually white men, that are willing to take up guns and um, assert their authority by threatening violence. Um, and recently this year, uh, there was... Just in the last few days, uh, 15 individuals were arrested in Michigan for planning to kidnap the governor because she had been um, too dictatorial, they thought, in terms of her restrictions on things to stop the spread of the coronavirus. So the argument is you get all this kind of stuff going on because the it's hard to compete otherwise with very unpopular policies that benefit just a few wealthy individuals. Um, it's also, I think, worth pointing out, and a lot of scholarship is focused on this recently, that America has a very unique history, and the Deep South especially has strong anti-democratic norms. So that culture uh, was founded by slave, slave lords from Barbados coming over and bringing their slave codes with them. And so you have this whole class, planner class, that seeing themselves as rightful rulers. Um, and there's even, at many points, they or at least at some points they even talked about rationales for enslaving poor white people. Um, this is from um, Colin Woodard's book, um, American Nations. Uh, here's a broader map of that, but he's one of his points is that the different areas that were just fo uh, founded by different cultures have to this day very different political cultures. So Yankee Dumb uh, tends to be very progressive and community oriented. Um, the Greater Appalachia was settled by um, Scots and Irish that had come from more torn areas, so they're very suspicious of government. And then the Deep South has its own culture um, and um, with a plantation kind of uh, system. So, and then others have argued that the, even though it started in the South, that Southern political culture has really extended across the whole nation. So the Southern political norms now dominate um, so this assumption that small government is the best, um, any kind of poverty is a personal failing, it doesn't require any government intervention. Uh, so Heather Cox uh, Richardson and Nancy McLean have both written about this. And then um, electorally, um, if you look back, the Republicans have exploited these white racial grievances, as they're called, uh, since going back to Nixon. So it's uh, Trump is just extending a uh, a thing that has gone on for a long time. But anyway, you can look up um, any of these books for more details on that. Okay, so some concluding thoughts. Ideology likely shaped by evolutionary origins. Um, both RWA and SDO can motivate climate change denial. 
SDO can recruit RWA. So that's where they try to convince um, your religious folks and others that environmentalism is a threat to their values and um, that they're trying to hoodwink them and um, get them uh, to commit to something that's going to ultimately undermine their religious values. And then if you want to try to understand why we've had a harder time with this, the plutocratic populism uh, offers a way of uh, connecting the wealth income disparity gaps to the changes that have happened in our economic conditions. And then, uh, so from a broader perspective, this is a challenge, but uh, on this and other issues that um, if you want to have democratic institutions that can enact policies that are um, that work for the greater good, for the greater whole, um, it probably needs to have some changes to our tax system and other policies that will um, tame the power of the, the wealthy relative to the rest. All right, that is it for the spiel on ideology. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.